Well, I would like to welcome all of you to our service of worship today. It's very good to see uh, such a goodly number of people uh, coming, and particularly if you're uh, visiting in the area, if you're holidaying in either the caravan sites or one of the uh, local uh, areas of accommodation, you're most welcome, and we do trust that uh, as many as possible will be able to stay afterwards in the hall for a cup of tea. You're all uh, invited to do so. So we do thank you for coming and trust that you might know God's blessing. And I'm sure those of you who are visitors have already uh, come to the conclusion that this morning is uh, Children's Day uh, due to the, the fact that the, the boys and girls and others are occupying the, the front of the church. Just one or two announcements that I would make. Uh, Martin will take the service next uh, Sunday. And then the technology team, there will be a meeting uh, and training for the technology team tomorrow Monday evening uh, at 7.30 in the church here. And if there's anyone else interested uh, who knows a bit about technology, uh, even some of the young people, if you want to come along, uh, you'll be made most welcome. And if you could let Hillary know of your intention, of your interest. Then the Bushmills Cooperative Fridge Community Fridge will continue on Friday the 9th. Uh, if you just note that date, it's Friday the 9th of June in the morning from 11.30 to 1 in the minor hall, and there's free tea and coffee. The June issue of the Presbyterian Herald is now available in the uh, link corridor. These are all the announcements I want to make. We're going to begin our service as we join together in the peace he made the stars to shine. <laughs> And I'm going to invite uh, Beth to come forward and to lead us in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this beautiful day and for the opportunity to worship you here this morning. We thank you for the many things that are our life so special our health and strength, food and clothes, friends and family. God, we thank you for our Sunday school and Bible classes where we hear your word and learn how to behave and live as you want us to. Please be with our Sunday school teachers, Bible class leaders and everyone who helps us around the church. God, please guide us, keep us safe and be with us every day of our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Beth. And now the Sunday School are going to sing the piece entitled Shine. You live in me. No, you love me. 
Genesis 37, verse 12 to 21. Joseph is sold by his brothers. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring the word back to me. Then he sent him off to the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing the flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But then they saw him at a distance and began, re- and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal has devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Thank you, Charlotte. And I'm going to have a solo uh, with... Isabella Walker and Charlotte will accompany her on the piano. All things bright and beautiful. Thank you, uh, Isabella and Charlotte. Now we're all going to join together 
in singing a very well-known children's hymn, The Wise Man Built His House Upon a Rock. Now we're going to have our second reading, and it will be read by Maggie Kreth, and it's found in Genesis 50. Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. Joseph reassures his brothers. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the father, of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Thank thank you, Maggie. Now the children are going to sing again to us the piece, Joy, Joy, Joy.
Well, thanks very much, boys and girls. That was really good. And uh, I think we'll, we'll ask the mummies and daddies to sing now for a while. Huh? I think so. Well, we will. Well, we'll uh, all join together in singing the piece, Our God is a Great Big God. <laughs> Now here in Bush Mills, not only is there a, a Sunday school, but also we have a Bible class. And we're going to ask the Bible class to uh, take part for a moment or two now. And this will be primarily Angus, Archie and Scott. And the question is, what do you think of when you hear the word church? And uh, that's a very important question to ask. You know, what do we think? What do we think the church is? Well, uh, I'm sure we'll possibly get an answer in a moment or two. What do you think of when you hear the word church? Our building in Bush Mills, a group of Presbyterian churches in Ireland, an organisation run by a minister in session? Do you know who first used the word church in the Bible? It was Jesus. Jesus said he would build the church on the truth that he is Christ, the Son of God. We have looked at what the Bible has to say about the church. The Bible gives us a number of pictures of what the church is like. These all refer to the people and not the building where the church meets. These pictures include that the church is the body of Christ and a family showing God's love. First, what does the Bible say about the church as the body of Christ and how should this affect our behaviour as Christians? We all play an important role in the body of Christ, also known as the church, and has given us all gifts to help. Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians tells us that in our human body, our eyes and our feet were made to do very different things. Our eyes were made to see and our feet were made to walk. If our eyes and our feet decided to change places, how would we see and how would we walk? The body of the Christ is the same way. God has given us our special gifts as part of the church. When we use our gifts well, the whole body of Christ works like it should, to show God's love to each other and the world. But when we don't use our gifts or wish we had different gifts, it's like an eye wishing to be a foot. God made you to be you with your own unique gifts and talents. We should think about how we can use the gifts God has given us to follow Jesus and serve others as part of the church. Second, what does the Bible say about the church's family and how should this affect our behaviour as Christians? In Ephesians 2 verse 19 it says that we belong to the family of believers. And in John chapter 1 verse 12, it says that we are the children of God to those who believe in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. After Jesus went up to heaven, the first church people prayed together. They shared their meals together and they shared their time with each other. They tried to live like Jesus by putting others first. The church then is not a club or an organisation or a building. The church is God's people. It is made up of people who are following Christ. 
The church is where you come to meet and work together with God's people. We don't go to church, we are the church. Thank you very much indeed, boys, for that very um, clear outline of what the church is, that it's not just a club or an organisation, but it is a body of people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their saviour and who have become Christians. Not something that we always were, something that we become, and that means then that we are part of the church. And I suppose the question that all of us need to ask as we come along Sunday by Sunday is, am I a true member of the church, not a, just on the role of the church or have been baptised in the church, but have I become a follower of the Lord Jesus? Have I asked Christ to be my saviour as I have confessed my sin to him? Your offering will now be received. Now let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, we come today and we give you thanks that we can meet together here to encourage the young folks and the children of the church. And we pray that you'll be with them as they would go to school tomorrow and as they would be involved in all sorts of things that they do at school, that they may have good friends, that their friends may be a source of encouragement and help and always influence in, on the way that is right. And as we pray for the, the younger children of the church, we remember those who are uh, a little older, and those who go to secondary school, and those who are sitting examinations at this time, those who will be doing GCSEs and AS levels and A levels, grant that you would bring to the remembrance those things that they have been learning over the years that have passed that they may be able to give of their best and that they will be able to get the, the grades that they desire and that their aspirations for the future may become a reality for them. And so, our Father, we just pray for all the young folks uh, and we pray for those who teach and instruct uh, in the home and also in the church and we pray that they may know your help and blessing as they lead and guide. And we come to you this morning and we thank you that we can present to you our gifts of our offerings and we know that uh, you give to us uh, many good things in life for our own benefit and for use for your glory and we know that by our giving we cannot enrich you neither by our withholding can we impoverish you but we do know that you do love the cheerful giver and we pray that you would receive these offerings and use them for the extension of your kingdom both locally and globally we pray this in Jesus name Amen now we're going to continue 
to sing together the piece, God is Good, God is Great. And then after uh, that, we sing that, we'd ask the boys and girls who are at the front if they would like to go down and sit in the, the seats at, at the front of the church as well. Well, boys and girls, it's very good that you were able to sit up at the front this morning and do so well. Do you think you deserve a clap? Yeah. I think you do too. <laughs> and we want to just say, before we go any further, we want to say a word of thanks to the teachers, to Gillian and all the band of teachers in the Sunday school, and to Audrey and Ruth uh, for what they do in the Bible class, not only today, but, but throughout the year. It's very good that they help us so much and we do appreciate uh, all, all that they do. So thank you very much indeed. As well as again, thank you for all who took part here at the front, those of you who were singing, and the voice in the Bible class as well, for giving us that very informative talk on what is the church. Now, for a few minutes this morning, what we're going to do is I'm going to mostly get you to look up at the screen there behind me and uh, we're going to tell you a story. But you know sometimes, how many of you ever watch TV? Put your hand up if you watch the TV. You do? 
Great. Well, sometimes in TV there's a story that starts at a certain time, maybe at three o'clock in the afternoon, and it finishes at half three, and that's it done. But sometimes there's stories, and they start at three o'clock in the afternoon, and they finish at half three, but then you have to look at it tomorrow, or the next day, or the next day, and they keep going on and on and on and on, and it's a, what they call a serial story. It's not just one story, but it's one big long story in a whole lot of parts. And we're going to look together this morning at, uh, well, a couple of parts out of a big long story. And does anybody think they know what the story is going to be about, or who it's going to be about? Yes. Who? Jesus, yes, Jesus will come into it. Anybody else uh, who you think will come into it? Yeah? God. God will come into it, yes, very good. Yeah? God. Yes. Well, who, who did we read about from the Bible this morning? <coughs> yes? Joseph. Joseph, yes. Joseph's going to come into it as well. In fact, he's going to be the centre of the story for a wee while at the beginning. And we're going to talk to, about Joseph. Well, Joseph, you remember the story of Joseph. Joseph was a member of a big family, and he was the favourite son. And what was it that he got that nobody else in the, in the family got? Yes? A rainbow coat. He got, well, I'm not sure if it was a rainbow coat, but it was a coat that had many colours. Uh, and uh, yes, it had all these colours. I'm not sure exactly whether they were all the same colours as the rainbow or not, but uh, yes, there, there, it was a coat. And you know, Joseph thought that he was the bee's knees because he got this coat. And of course, he always boasted to his other brothers, you know, I'm better than you, my dad likes me better than he likes you because look at this lovely coat that he's given to me. And so uh, they didn't always think well of Joseph. They were a bit annoyed at Joseph boasting like this. But we see that, the next picture, we see that uh, when Joseph sat down and talked to the brothers and told about a dream he had, they were really, really cross. Because what Joseph was saying was, you know, I'm really better than you, and one day something's going to happen, and you're all going to bow down to me, and I'm going to be the special person in this family. However, as time went on, it was decided by his dad that he should go out to the hillside and see that his brothers were getting on all right because they were looking after the sheep in the fields. And so off Joseph went. And the brothers were sitting, looking after the sheep, and they saw Joseph coming in the distance. And they thought to themselves, here's this boy that we don't like. Now, they should have liked him, but they didn't like him. And what we're going to do is we're going to throw him into a pit. And that's what they did. Now, they were going to do other things to him, but they decided at the end that they would throw him into a pit. And there was poor Joseph was stuck down into this pit, and he couldn't get out of it. And then suddenly there was this group of people who were coming along and they were called slave traders. They were people who bought other people and took them and sold them to people who were very rich and the rich people had these people as their slaves. And so poor Joseph was hauled out of the pit. He was sold to these people who were the slave traders and he was taken to another country. He was taken to the country of Egypt. And we're told that Joseph in Egypt was then sold as a slave to this man who was called Potiphar. And Potiphar was a very rich man indeed. Well, Joseph did very well. And he worked really hard for Potiphar. And he did all the things that were right. But suddenly, for one reason or another, Potiphar thought that Joseph wasn't behaving as he should and that he didn't want him to be his slave anymore. In fact, he told all sorts of stories along with his wife about Joseph and Joseph was arrested and Joseph was thrown into prison. And there's poor Joseph in prison and none of us would like to be in prison, but there he was and there he was sitting by himself. And then suddenly, he discovered that the prison door opened and in walked two other people. These two people worked for the king. One was the king's butler and the other was the king's baker. One got the king his food and helped the king in that sort of way 
and the other baked the cakes for the king. And in the meantime, what was happening was the king had uh, some dreams. And there he was, the king was lying one night in bed. And he had these dreams. And it was a very funny dream. I, do, do any of you ever dream at times? Put your hand up if you dream. Hi. Do any of the mummies and daddies dream? Put your hand up if you dream. Hmm, quite a small percentage of people in Bushmills dream. That's quite remarkable. But, uh, or else you, you've got to you can't put your hand up. But anyway, however, uh, we see that they, they, he, this man dreamed. And he didn't understand what this dream was all about. And suddenly the butler and the baker, well, one of them, who had gone back to work for the king, we see that he said to the king, oh, I know there's a guy and he's in jail and he will be able to tell you what that dream is all about. So they smartened Joseph up, they cleaned him up and Joseph went in to the king's palace and he explained that there was going to be seven years when there was going to be an awful lot of food, huge amount of food, far more food than was needed. And then there was going to be seven years when there was going to be a shortage. And Joseph said to the king, here's what you need to do. You need to save the food during those years when there's plenty. And then you need to give it out carefully when there's not enough food. People can come and you can give them enough to keep them going for a short period of time. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. That was what uh, Joseph did. So Joseph was now telling the king uh, as to what he was to do, and that's in the next picture. And uh, as far as the king was concerned, he thought, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make Joseph the head man, and he's going to be responsible to bring all the food in that we don't need to store it in big stores, and then when the time comes that it needs to be given out when there's not very much food, he'll be responsible for doing that. And so that's what the next picture shows us. That Joseph started to give out the food to people when it was needed. Meantime, away back in the country where Joseph had lived, there was no food either. And Joseph's brothers decided that they would come up and see if they could get some food in Egypt. And there they came and they met up with Joseph. But Joseph suddenly realized, hi, these are my brothers. These are the boys that sold me as a slave. These are the boys that were very bad to me. And what am I going to do? And we see that Joseph was very upset as he thought about all that had happened in the past and he wondered, what am I going to do? And so he, he came back out to the people again, his brothers, and he told his brothers that he was Joseph, the brother that they had got rid of and they had sold into Egypt. And here's what the problem was. Joseph's brothers were worried because they had done wrong. And the next question they were asking themselves was, would Joseph forgive them? Well, I'm sure we've heard this story before, and this was what the, the end of the story was, that Joseph did forgive them. He gave them all a big hug, and he thought, isn't this great? My brothers are still alive, and, well, I want to forgive them for the wrong things that they were doing. Okay? And then what he said was, now, what I want you to do is, I want you to go back home and bring Dad and all the other members of the family circle, bring them up to Egypt, and I'll make sure that they have plenty of food and that they'll be all right and they'll be safe during this time of famine. So what did Joseph do? Joseph forgave his brothers because they were sorry. Now, we're going to watch another wee film this time, and it's not about Joseph, but it's about Eric. Anybody called Eric? Any of you folks called Eric? No? No, no, right. Well, it'll not matter. 
Well, let's see the wee picture about Eric. Hey guys, some words are really hard to say. Words like discombobulated. But I want to tell you a story today about a word that can be even harder to say than that. In fact, it's probably one of the hardest words you could ever say. The word is sorry, a tiny word that's hard to say, but thankfully there is a way, as my little mate Eric discovers in this story. Would you like to hear it? Cool. Right then, get yourself comfy and let's get cracking. The sun shone bright on a hot summer's day as Eric went out in the garden to play. He placed the ball on the penalty spot, then whack, he unleashed a mighty shot. Up, up, up sailed the ball above the bar, high into the sky over Percy Price's yard. Thump, thumpity thump, Eric's heart beat fast. Down came the ball with a thunderous crash. Oh, my days, Eric cried in distress as he peeked through the hedge to assess the mess. A scene of destruction greeted his eyes. Percy's pansies are pulverised! Filled with dread, Eric fled to the shed. Scanning the shelves, he scratched his head. Aha! he exclaimed. I know what to do! And he soon returned with a tube of glue. He crawled through a hole that he found in the hedge, rolled up his sleeves and took a deep breath. Then, soil to pot and petals to stem, he put the pansies together again. Buzzing, said Eric feeling quite clever. That was until a turn in the weather. A gust of wind toppled the pot which shattered again. Eric's jaw dropped. Suddenly a small face snooped through the hedge. It was Eric's little sister who didn't look impressed. Oi Eric, what did you do? And why are you smothered in petals and glue? I didn't do anything, Eric replied. But little sis knew that her big bro had lied. Eric was guilty and boy did he know it. But if he was sorry, his face didn't show it. I'm telling mum, she threatened her brother. Tell me what, came the voice of their mother. And there through the hole, mum loomed into view. Oh no, groaned Eric. Now what do I do? It was Lily, said Eric, shifting the blame. His cheeky cheeks now blushing with shame. I'm sure she's sorry, no harm done. But Eric could see that he didn't fool mum. Eric was busted, and boy did he know it. But if he was sorry, he still didn't show it. Don't tell dad, Eric cried in despair. Don't tell me what, boomed a voice on the air. And there through the hedge, a third face peered. And with it, all hope of escape disappeared. D -d -d dad, stuttered Eric, w -w what a surprise. But the panic in his eyes could not be disguised. Hey Eric, called dad, what's occurring? Eric's a vandal, said Lily, stirring. Well, it could have been worse, Eric insisted. I didn't smash a window like Lily once did. Eric was squirming and twisting and turning, but his distraction tactic was crashing and burning. Eric was guilty, and boy did he know it. But now he was sorry, and his sad eyes showed it. Eric, my boy, we can fix this mess. But is there something you need to confess? Yes, blurted Eric. It's all my fault. I unleashed a shot like a thunderbolt. I've clearly got super soccer powers because the ball flew for miles and wrecked these flowers. So I ran to the shed and raided your shelf and I nicked the glue to fix it myself. Lily came over so I told her a lie but then I blamed her when mum swung by. And now you're here and I feel so bad. I'm really, really sorry, dad. His father smiled and reached out his hand. You're forgiven. Now hurry, because dad's got a plan. Quick as a flash, Eric dashed back through and was met with hugs, despite all the glue. They cleaned him up and then popped to the shop to purchase a pot for Percy's plot. Eric held up a coin. It's all I've got. Don't worry, said Dad. I've paid for the lot. Thanks, said Eric, but I don't deserve it. You're right, said Dad, but no one's perfect. Learn this lesson and never forget it. This is called grace and grace is epic. What's grace? asked Eric. Well, said his dad, it's undeserved kindness when we've been bad. We all mess up, but God loves us still. Grace puts things right and it pays the bill. Amazing, said Eric, but how does he pay? Son, whispered dad, there is only one way. 
Jesus paid for our sins with his blood on the cross. Wow, exclaimed Eric. Grace costs a lot. Dad, declared Eric, grace is cool. I just hope that Percy thinks so too. Eric trudged up the path to Percy's door. He knocked, then waited, then knocked once more. The door creaked open and there was Percy. Eric held up the pot and pleaded for mercy. I, I, I smashed your pot and destroyed your pansies. I'm so sorry, Percy. Please forgive me. Percy gently took the pot. Thank you, Eric. This means a lot. You've learned your lesson, I can tell. All is forgiven. I wish you well. The grateful lad walked home with his dad, amazed that grace had made him unsad. Eric was loved, and boy did he know it. His sorry was gone, and his big smile showed it. Well, boys and girls, that's a wee story about Eric. And, well, just as Joseph forgave his brothers for doing bad things to him, so we see that Eric was forgiven for doing the things that he did that were wrong and telling lies about it and not admitting that he had done, done wrong. And right at the beginning of the story there about Eric, there was something was, said, something was said and it was this. What do you think is one of the hardest words to say? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. That's right. It's very hard for a boy or girl sometimes when they do something wrong to say sorry. Likewise, it's be even more hard for an adult to say sorry. But when it comes to wanting to follow the Lord Jesus, all of us need to be able to say sorry. To say sorry for the wrong things that we've done. To say sorry that we have done what the Bible calls we have sinned in so many different ways. But we remember what was said there about Eric. Eric experienced grace. And grace was forgiveness. And we can all experience God's grace, which is his forgiveness, when we say sorry for our sins. It's not coming to church makes us a Christian. It's not even if we're a bit older, sitting around the Lord's table makes us a Christian. It's saying sorry for our sin and asking Jesus to be our saviour as we thank him on, for dying on the cross for us. So as we come this morning to Children's Day, let's remember about Joseph, how that he forgave his brothers. Let's remember about how Eric was forgiven. And let's remember too that you and I can be forgiven when we ask the Lord Jesus to save us from our sins and to help us to live as he would want us to live. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come this morning and we thank you for all your goodness to us. And we thank you that you've been with us throughout this service, helping us in our singing, in our reading, in all that we've done. Help us to remember that you love us, that you want to forgive us, and that when we ask you into our lives that we can know that you will be with us every day of our lives and that one day we will be with you also in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to finish our service as we join together in the peace Jesus love is very wonderful.
And now, Father, we pray that you'll go with us as we go to our homes. May we continue to know your help in our lives every day, today and tomorrow, and throughout the rest of our lives. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with each of us now and forevermore. Amen.